Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through Your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. For joining us. As we prepare our hearts to worship together, I'm going to read from Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God, you saved my soul. 
opportunity now to bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord as an act of worship. And I know many of our businesses and our finances have been hard hit by this lockdown time. But let's remember that story of the widow that gave her two cents, her two pennies worth. When she put it in the offering box, it was pleasing to the Lord. So let's give what we can and please the Lord as we're worshiping in this way. Oh 
Good morning, Glen Eden Church, friends and family. We continue our studies today in the book of Philippians, and I'm going to be reading from Philippians chapter 3, verse 9 to 11. Because verse 9 begins mid-sentence, I want to backtrack a little bit into verse 8. And this is Paul speaking. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Let's pray together. Father God, according to your word, thank you that we will be found in you. Thank you that our relationship is faith-based and not based on keeping the law, the Ten Commandments, and other legal requirements. Father, in faith this morning, we want to hand over to you any fear that we have, anything that needs to be surrendered to you. And we just pray an increased measure of faith in our relationship with you. I pray your blessing over the word this morning and your anointing too, Father. Please open our spiritual eyes and ears to receive what you have to say to us today. Amen. God bless. Good morning, friends. It's an absolute privilege to be able to share God's word with us this morning. Thank you, Mert, for that reading and prayer, and lovely to see your surroundings on the farm. Last week, we looked at one verse, particularly, where we unpacked what the finished work of Christ's death and resurrection on the cross has achieved for us. And I'm sure this week you've had time to just further study those weighty words full of rich meaning of God's mercy, grace, and justice for us. And so we're going to continue now. But for those that are watching for the first time or really have only been recently, I want you to know we have been going through the book of Philippians since the beginning of this year. We never would have imagined a lockdown, let alone a global pandemic. But it has been so timeless as we have seen Paul's affection for this church from a distance. Remember, he's in house arrest or in a prison cell somewhere in Rome. And he's writing back to a church that he planted. And he's writing with such affection. There's, there's such joy in this letter. There, there is mutual grace shown to each other as we've looked over the last few weeks. And so as we have been on this journey, church, let me remind us that this has been about learning that Christ is enough. He's enough in all circumstances. He should be enough for our mountaintop moments and no doubt for our valleys. He's enough when it seems like the world is shaking and so much around us is falling apart. He is enough when it seems like everything else has been stripped away. He is enough because He has achieved for us only that which He could do, be a ransom for our sins, be a sacrifice for a holy God, be the one who could trade His innocence for our guilt, His righteousness for our condemnation, and therefore in that great exchange present us to God as holy, blameless, now his sons and his daughters. And so we're going to continue in chapter 3. And as Mert read those verses, we're going to look at this theme in verse 10. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings becoming like him in his death. Imagine spending time with Paul just before the end of his life and you wanting to ask him all that he's learnt. You're sitting across the table from him. You can see the age on his face. He, he bears the scars of beatings. He's told you about his sufferings. His hands maybe tremble from age, but also just the exertion that he's been through for many years. And as you sit there across the table, you lean in and you say, Paul, just teach me, what has it been like for you to be a follower of Christ? After all these years, 
You must have a library of experience, a wealth of knowledge, wisdom. Just give me some tips, Paul, on, on, on what it's like to be a follower of Christ who's effective in their calling, um, bringing glory to God in, their, in your job or your family, whatever it might be, whatever it is that you have, and, and you just want some little gems from Paul as you would leave him and take away and go, now I'm going to apply this. And so you lean in and you say, Paul, just give it to me. What, what, what have you learned after all these years? What's that one nugget of truth that you could just share with me right now? And just picture with me as a, as a storyteller. I, I can kind of imagine the scene. His, his hands tremble. He, he kind of takes a sip of the water on the table in the glass and he looks up at you and I would imagine with tears in his eyes, he stares into you and he says, Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and that I might share in his sufferings. So that I might be like him in his death. Even the weight of it now. Just the emotion. And I think he would have tears running down his face. As he holds your hand. And with love. And compassion in his eyes. He would say my friend. Don't stop wanting to know him and in knowing him know the power of his resurrection in your life and know that this power is not to get us away from suffering but this very power so transforms you that you can go through this life and endure suffering. Why? So that at the end of your life, like I'm at the end of mine, Paul would say, I want to die like Christ. I don't think an encounter like that would ever leave us the same. That's the, the weight of what we need to get when we read these verses. That's the power that we need to take when we hear like Paul say, I want to know him. At the end of his life, he's crying out for that. I want to know him. If we were to unpack that word, that word know is not an intellectual knowing. It's not like I were to ask you, do you know about the Arctic? And you would say, well, yeah, I do. I, I've read a bit about it. I've seen some documentaries. Oh, my favorite is Happy Feet, the film with the penguins. Yeah, I know. I know quite a bit about it. But you don't know it experientially. You haven't lived there. You haven't felt the ice the frigid winds and the temperatures that drop below zeros for half the year. In the same way, if I were to say to you of Joe, do you know Joe? You know Joe, right? And you say, of course, Joe, your better half. <laughs> I would agree with you. But the one that just is so courageous, bold, is a mother of five. Um, your wife, shame, shame, wow. But an amazing woman, I know her. I'd say, well, yeah, you do. You know her intellectually. Uh, you know her from stories and maybe a few interactions. But you don't know her like I know her. You don't know her experientially. Through all the great adventures that her and I have been on together. Through all the highs, the lows, the tears, the laughter, the love, the passion. You don't know her like I do. And that's what Paul is crying out for when he says, I want to know 
him and the power of his resurrection. Paul says, I want to know experientially the power that comes in my life as I know what he achieved for me in his resurrection. And therefore, I also want to share with him in his sufferings. Friends, because in the Christian life, there is no resurrection without suffering. There is no glory at the end of this life without the road that's narrow and hard to travel. But Paul says, oh, I want to know that. We can take some clues this morning and I want to take us through a few scriptures that will unpack for us what this power is that Paul was longing to know and what this power can be for us. Because knowing this power is what will enable us to endure hardship and suffering. Knowing this power will know what we have gained in Christ's resurrection and what we can hope for in the end. And so let's read some verses together. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 to 22. Paul writes, Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above all rule, authority, power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but in the one to come we see these words power it's the word dunamos it's this explosive reality that comes into our lives and the explosive reality that brought christ out of that tomb it's not the, the same as the, the word power to refer to an authority structure those powers in the heavenly realms, or that power over a nation. It's not an authority. It's an exerted dynamite reality. But it's also not a once-off blast. It's this growing from strength to strength. The power that raised Christ from the dead is the power that Paul is longing for when he says, I want to know this power, and it's found in Christ's resurrection. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him. And seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Paul says, He has now made us alive with Christ. And now Christ is seated in heavenly places and has all rule. We, Paul says in Ephesians, are seated with Christ. We are raised with Christ. And it's all by grace that we have been saved. And all to do this in the coming ages to show toward us his immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. In kindness, friends, God has raised you up. Ephesians 3 verse 20 to 21 says the following. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Here Paul says that there is a power that is at work within us. 
And this power enables us to trust that God can do immeasurably more than we could ask or think because of this power that's at work. This resurrecting power that would take a broken man and bring him to spiritual life, turn his eyes from death to life, Break a hard heart of pride and arrogance, persecuting the church, now humble at his very end, saying, I want to know his power in the resurrection. Paul knows this power because it's the power that raised Christ from the dead and is now at work powerfully in him. And Paul wants us to know from this reading in Ephesians, it's this power that is at work within us that gives us this confidence to ask God to do things in our lives, in this local church, in our nation, in the nations of this world, during this global pandemic, that we could say, God, we trust you. Now, beyond what we could ask or think, do your will for your glory because there is a working of your power within us. You've raised us from death to life. Colossians 1 verse 29. Paul writes, For this I toil, for this I work hard, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And so Paul's saying, that journey of sanctification, we've been speaking so much about that over this time. Friends, none of us should be bored during a lockdown. Actually, it's the mercy and the grace of God who would give us space from a very busy life to enjoy Him, enjoy His mercy and His grace, and let the work of sanctification be a journey of wonder and discovery and Paul says to this end I'm toiling but what not with his energy not with his good works not with his uh, knowledge and what he's built up over the years not even with his studies Paul says I'm working hard because there's an energy within me God's work that God's powerfully working within me Friends, can you feel that powerful work of God in your life? I hope you can. I hope you can say that right now, wherever you are. Yes, I know that work. Because that's the work of God. Because we have been raised from death to life. Fighting sin is letting God work powerfully in our life. We can't overcome sin. We can't white-knuckle this life, deal with our issues, our addictions, the things that we keep going back to that we just hate. We need to come before God and rejoice that we have been brought from darkness to light, death to life. And His energy is what Paul says, because of His energy, His power, I am toiling hard. Colossians 1 verse 9. The end of this wonderful prayer, Paul says, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience and joy. Friends, there's such a wonder in the power of the resurrection when Paul would say, now that you are brought from darkness to light, He doesn't just say, well, now you better start working really hard. The Christian life isn't about the gospel that brings us into this walk of faith and then it's all up to us. The gospel continues to be at work within our lives. We are saved by grace and God's work of sanctification is a work of grace. Be strengthened with all power. According to his glorious might. For all endurance, patience and joy. Those are the three hinges of a door that now leads us into enduring through suffering. Paul says, I want to share in his 
sufferings. It was a bold uh, decision that Paul was making. Whatever comes my way, whatever I endure, whatever I have to go through, I'm going to do it because Christ has already gone through it for me. If I'm going to share in the power of his resurrection, I'm going to share in the journey of his suffering. And so Paul would say in this verse, verse 9, Now, this power, according to his glorious might, is going to give us endurance for this life, patience when we wish things to just speed up and be done with, and the pain and the suffering to be over, and joy been such a great theme of ours over this series together and this letter is filled with this theme joy in what joy in christ joy that your future is secure joy that your hope lies in what christ has done already not joy in circumstances joy in christ and friends we can pray this for each other we can encourage this for each other, but it's not something we can do for each other. I can't give you endurance. I can't give you patience. I can't give you joy. <laughs> I can't even do that for myself. Nathan can't wake up in the morning and say, Be brave, boy. Have endurance today. Be patient in suffering today. Where's that joy? Come on, put it on. We can't do it. Paul says, but what we can do is be strengthened with power, which is his might, which is working within us, so that we can go through suffering. And like Paul said, I'm going to share in that. If I'm going to share in his resurrection, I want to share in his sufferings. Can you do that this morning? Can you say with all hope that Christ is enough, come what may? I will walk this road because of his might within me and I am going to cry out to him for grace to endure, grace to be patient and grace to have joy. Jesus said in Luke 29, 23, and 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Luke 9, 23 to 24. Jesus is saying, friends, come follow me. Be with me. Learn from me. Do what I did. But remember that in this life, you taking up your cross. It's that reminder that you will know the power of my resurrection and the sharing of my sufferings. Like Paul, we can say, I want to know this. Glen Eden Church, is this your desire is this my desire lord let it be our desire our longing that we would know the power of your resurrection and that we would share in your sufferings so that we might be like you in your death and therefore in whatever way enjoy this resurrection that is promised to us Let's pray together. Friends, wherever you are right now, if you're a follower of Christ, I want you to thank God that He so loved you that He sent Christ into this world. Not just to be a model of life, but to be a model of suffering and death. We thank you, God, that you, by the power of the Spirit, raised Christ from the dead. You've seated him in heavenly places. He has all rule and authority. And as we've put our trust in you, you seat us with Christ. 
You give us that, that perspective right now, God, that we are firmly living on planet Earth, but in our spiritual state, we are, and we are seated with Christ. Oh, we thank you for the power of the resurrection. We thank you for the work that's within us. And now, God, give us your church, the witness in this community and the city and the nations of the world. Give us this witness to endure, to be patient, to be full of hope because of your power that's at work within us. God, this morning, I pray that you'd set some free from working hard to please you. Set some people free from feeling that they have got to muster up this power, this life-giving reality. Set those free that feel that they're not attaining the life that they wish they could. Set people free from the guilt of, of a past, even a present, of continuing to fail in their own eyes set your sons and your daughters free today God where they are listening into this that they would feel the spirit come and breathe life again into their bodies set us free as a local church God to live out this gospel reality every single day that we knowing the power of your resurrection and we sharing in your sufferings this watching world needs to see a church that is living out the gospel, that's not afraid of difficulty or hardship or sufferings, but that within it we are able to celebrate and show the power of Christ within our lives. God, be glorified through your church, I pray, right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's beginning